This channel uh, usually gives you my attempts at popularizing and I'm a little bit in a learning process with that. But uh, this video is an exception. It's just basically a piece of my normal academic work. Um, yes. Uh, and I think it might be relevant for followers of this channel who can, uh, who can stom stomach academic language. Cool. Uh, this is a paper that I gave at the Chaos Conference in May 2019 in Oslo, Norway, about the intersection between religious and scientific knowledge systems. Um, um, my name is uh, Rune Janne Rasmussen. Uh, I've done my PhD on how people construct gods in the Afro-Brazilian religion called Candomblé, which is a religion comparable to Santeria or Vudun, a uh, Afro-American religion practiced in Brazil. In this uh, paper, I'll be talking about the synergies between religious and scientific knowledge forms in Candomblé spaces, both from a historic perspective, um, but also from the perspective of my own uh, new animist um, methodology. I originally called this uh, paper Voodoo Scholarship, uh, in spite of the fact I'm working with Candomblé and not with Voodoo, uh, because the word Voodoo doesn't only refer to the Haitian Voodoo religion, uh, it's also uh, iconic of the imagined African religion as an icon of the primitive superstitious other, uh, and my paper addresses uh, some of the impact and persistence of this stereotypical and even racist colonial imagery that is sort of condensed in that word. Um, this has the roots in the Atlantic culture encounter, where the concept of fetishism was constructed as a defining other to the rationalist European self. Uh, the African religiosity was seen as an ultimate occult other, an irrational, primitive, childish, regressive superstition that would mirror and thereby legitimize the rational, progressive self-image of European modernity. Uh, this knowledge hierarchy has had a long history in scholarship and thinking. Fetishism has become the sort of icon of the false, the distorted somehow. Uh, to Freud, uh, uh, fetishism was the perverted. <clears throat> to Marx, it was a false understanding of value. And uh, uh, we, we all know the term voodoo economics, which is a false understanding of economy. Uh, in my own discipline, uh, history of religions, this history is also very visible and it has, has, has been, I think, quite resilient, resilient and long-lived, uh, particularly in the general relation between a rationalist science and religion as these sort of opposed uh, knowledge systems whose mixing is conceived as uh, fundamentally transgressive or destructive to science. <clears throat> My um, student colleague, uh, the sociologist of religion, Birgitta Schepelan, did a PhD research back in 2007 about how science of religion in religions in Denmark positions its secularism by constructing religion as this defining other. And uh, well, the situation has probably changed since then, but when Birgitta did a field work, you could still hear professors uh, of religious sciences in Copenhagen talk of religion as a kind of psychological disorder. Uh, there are cases of prof professors instructing students to study under the motto that we cannot talk to, talk with the religious person. We can only talk about the religious person. You see, it's, it's like it's a very programmatic statement of objectifying the persons whose knowledge you, you want to re research and excluding even the possibility of actually communicating with them. Um, I do sense that on the cultural level, that religion as a kind of craziness is still, I would say, a little bit of a topos uh, among Danish historians of religion. Uh, when I look at my Facebook feed, uh, there are a lot of posts from my, my colleagues who um, uh, often have this unmistakably humoristic tone that tend to cast religion as this kind of goofy, silly thing. Uh, there was a point where I used to screenshot many of these posts because I, I actually find them quite interesting. Uh, the stuff that historians of religion find amusing in this particularly paternalistically jolly way is uh, an interesting study in how uh, Eurocentric modernist ideas uphold othering of specific other uh, knowledge practices. Which, by the way, is also what Shebelan points out uh, that this particular kind of discourse has the purpose of maintaining 
uh, a knowledge hierarchy in which religious knowledge is constructed as the irrational childish other to the enlightened rationalist science. Um, my personal position is that it's a bit of a problematic practice uh, with obvious colonial baggage, but I'm not going to go further into that here. Um, <clears throat> I actually believe that you can make really fine research on the background of the modern idea of religion as other. Uh, observing something at a distance has definite advantages. Uh, but I also believe that this particular uh, modern cosmology has been practiced in a way that has become far too absolute in a kind of exclusively normative way. Uh, for instance, I have myself have always been really attracted and fa to and fascinated by the transgression between uh, religion and, and, and science and scholarship. Um, and I've always myself been sort of related to or engaged, engaged in the stuff I'm studying. Um, I'm trying to practice uh, uh, a symmetrical methodology as suggested by Bruno Latour and, and others. Um, and as, as, uh, as far as possible, I'm trying to not privilege the modern ontology as uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro is suggesting or even actually to try to support the ontological self-determination of people whose reality I'm trying to learn from. Um, Graham Harvey <clears throat> suggests that, that our uh, analysis should basically learn by the ways in which shamans communicate with spirits and that thereby we may learn other ways of relating to the world, perhaps even ways that are a little bit less absolutely, apocalyptically, cataclysmically destructive than the ways we got from um, modernity. Right, so, uh, so anyway, it's, it's probably not a complete coincidence that I ended up uh, going into the study of exactly Afro-Brazilian religion, because this is a field with a, a long tradition for the strong and close synergy between scholarly and religious knowledge fields, uh, even between priesthoods and, and uh, cultural researchers, actually, uh, who are often the same persons. And, and this interface goes back about a century to a young Brazilian uh, by the name uh, Martignano Eliseo de Bonfim. And uh, he had uh, traveled back to the old world to get himself a higher education. Um, and when he came back to Brazil, he found a spread of a primitive and brutal worldview, which was European science. Martignano, he had uh, gone to Nigeria and acquired the advanced uh, Yoruba knowledge tradition, Ifa, got himself initiated. So when he got back to Brazil, he met a cultural research that considered uh, candomblé uh, religion as a kind of craziness, a uh, psychological disorder, a primitive fetishism, which was actually categorized as criminal insanity. Raimundo Nina Rodriguez, the first researcher in candomblé, actually worked <coughs> in, uh, from the basis of criminal psychology. <coughs> so Martignano Bonfim, he uh, rolled up his sleeves <laughs> and through the following generation, this voodoo priest, he worked intensely on civilizing anthropology. Uh, and he was uh, relatively uh, successful. Uh, Nina Rodriguez wasn't stupid, and uh, he uh, quickly left behind this evolutionary racism that considered the African religion as a mental disorder and craziness and so on. Uh, and uh, scholarship on Canomblé fairly quickly moved in the direction of much more culturalizing and sympathetically relativist positions. Uh, scholars came to really valorize canon play. And of course, the scholars are, are, are remembered much more than this black Yoruba intellectual who basically taught them how, taught them how to think. He was an informant. Um, but uh, beginning with Martignano here and up through the 20th century, the priesthood and scholarship in, in Candomblé has uh, been exchanging persons and scholars often become priests and uh, many has uh, become initiated in Candomblé. Priests also become scholars um, and also reflexive trends has, has kicked in that after deconstructing this collaboration, uh, the people who are doing the deconstruction are still actually part of the, part of the priest, priesthood. A uh, good example is uh, Stefania Capone, who's a possession priestess in the Canomblé house, but also a very prominent scholar in the deconstructive camp who are deconstructing the way that priests and scholars collaborate. Um, also in, in Scandinavia, several of the researchers that I know have gone through initiations in Canomblé, and uh, I've also myself gone through a, a form of initiation in, in, in a form of Canomblé. Um, this collaboration is, of course, not exhausted by this description. It's a long story in itself, and it had also had un unfortunate sites. 
Uh, I'm familiar with an example of an anthropologist who basically created a historically false legitimacy narrative for a temple that he was connected to uh, as part of basically a branding strategy. And uh, there are famous examples of research that become nonsensically speculative in exactly that way that the historian of religion inside me intuitively wants to label with the great marker of otherness of my discipline, and that is theology. For uh, historians of religion, theology is the iconic example of transgression where the religious knowledge refused to be othered and objectified uh, and to the great consternation of historians of religion participates in uh, scholarly production of knowledge. Uh, the example uh, of theology <laughs> is the famous book by Juan Albino Santos called uh, Oshnako, a march. Um, but aside from, from these Examples. I think I would say that people generally do know how to handle and navigate this knowledge synergy between religious and scholarly knowledge. A lot of research in Candomblé works from a quite modern epistemology. Um, there's a lot of sociology being done, and there's probably often a kind of methodological agnosticism of sorts. However, then today there is a new and wonderfully transgressive player on the field. And that is the uh, latest trends in anthropology, some, which is sometimes labeled ontology, Cambridge School, or relational anthropology, or new animist theory, and so on. And that's uh, the stuff I'm working with myself. Uh, and, and it is positions that moves closer to any other position that I know to the, the native's point of view. Um, and uh, like new animist anthropology can place itself very close to religious perceptions of the world, for instance. Uh, there's a focus on subjectivity, and, and then we find that subjectivity is not bounded, as in the modernist idea of subjectivity. It's distributed. It's relational. We talk about extended subjectivity and porous selves and stuff like that. And a, a deity, for instance, can be described as, and hold on to your socks now, like an intangible, agented, concatenated cluster of relational individual subjectivity. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> in human language, it means that a god is a person whose actions impact the world, more or less. And that's pretty crazy because it's a quite clear cut formulation of an insider view of what a baby is. And uh, this uh, post Cartesian cultural research uh, can operate with this on, on, uh, on the methodological and analytical level. In a modernist uh, scholarship, we want to see deities. Uh, and spirit as bounded holes of imagined beliefs, the deity stays inside that sphere of imagination or culture, something, right? <clears throat> and that maintains the boundedness of the modern subject. But the modern sub uh, and the human subjectivity is not compromised. But that is exactly the boundedness uh, of the human subjectivity. And that's exactly what a religion like Candomblé is trying to do all, all the time, compromising the boundedness of human subjectivity. Uh, most particularly in the phenomenon of possession, uh, which modernists have always spoken of as, of as like iconic of madness and collapse of rationality and so on. But in the, in the post-Cartesian anthropology, a deity is sort of a hub of relating in complex networks, which we build, uh, construct through exchanges by performative sharing uh, and creating consciousness of, of the deity. Now, according to Graham Harvey, for instance, an elephant spirit only becomes a spirit when it consciously and in a culturally appropriate way enter into non-elephant relation. Right? And the West Africans, I totally agree with this. Um, Deity is something that human, humans build in complex for, formation of relation. And <clears throat> I believe, by the way, that this is a more common idea that we would tend to think. Uh, I don't necessarily think that people always articulate what kind of thing a spirit or a god actually is. Uh, but I remember quite clearly from my student years when uh, Professor uh, uh, Jan Pullman Sørensen quoted Tord Olsen's great uh, Eureka moment, uh, which at that point annoyed me greatly, and I'm not sure why. Uh, Olsen had gotten home from um, studying Maasai religion, and uh, then, he, then he had the time to look properly at what a, a Maasai man had actually tried to explain him. Um, and Olsen had first understood that the man said, we believe in the God, and therefore we do ritual like this. But when he looked at the syntax in Maasai, he discovered that the causal relation was the opposite. The man had actually said, we do the ritual like this, and therefore we believe in the God. 
um, the Messiah formulated his belief in the deity as a result of the, his performance of ritual. And this is a, an experience that I've totally had in, in my work with Afro-Brazilian religion. <clears throat> Afro-Brazilian uh, religion, uh, Candomblé is very constructivist uh, kind of religiosity. And it is as if this constructive as aspect is really accentuated in the encounter actually with modernity. Candomblé practitioners only uh, apply concept or they apply concepts from modernity to formulate this constructivism. A god is primitive, but then it becomes evolved as we in the cult teach it to become itself. So there's a mirroring in the understanding of what a deity is. The, um, the West African constructivist, cons constructivist uh, worldview become, comes to articulate the constructivism in the account, encounter with modern epistemologies, where you, for instance, have evolutionism, like primitive and so on. Um, and with new animist theory, science uh, from Irving Hallowell and uh, going forward, uh, seems to have this growing suspicion that perhaps the Native Americans aren't actually superstitious, Perhaps it's our notion of subjectivity that's a little bit too primitive and reductive. And if we just adjust this, then swing subjectivity is suddenly re reintroduced in the wider reality. We were wrong. Native Americans were right. You know, there's this perhaps actually a subjectivity in the tree. Uh, so uh, when scholars move into this post-Cartesian phase, they, they exactly like West Africans. They can see gods as real, yet relationally constructed at the same time. <clears throat> so in the interface with modernity, these two knowledge systems are moving against each other and dialoguing uh, quite intensely, I think, with each other. Um, and it would be too much to go into details with what exactly this means to research methodology, but I will just take one example of how this works in, in my own research. Uh, and the example is uh, religious hierarchy. Uh, during my field work, work this was uh, really uh, annoying me. Uh, I think perhaps I had some remnant of this like 20th century functionalist notion of religious hierarchy. Uh, as you know, that religion is about producing social power, that that's kind of the purpose of religion to produce social power. Uh, but why the flip, you know, would then these young normal Westerners who flirt on their smartphone apps and drink beer with their friends and take education and physiotherapy, therapy, why would they invest enormous resources in performing this imagination of pre-colonial Yoruba feudalism. It didn't make any sense to me. But if you, if you take a relational angle on it, then it does make sense. It's not the gods that produce social status, it's the other way around. It's the social status that produce the gods. Uh, the management of subjectivity, which is made <coughs> possible by social hierarchies is a formation of relation that produce deities through subjectifying and objectifying techniques. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to take that one once more because it's a, like a, one sentence that condenses a hell of a lot of material from my research. The management of subjectivity, which is made possible by social hierarchies, is a formation of relation that produce deities through subjectifying and objectifying techniques. Okay, <laughs> you can also move it back in here again. Canon uh, they have this trickle-down cosmology, which is a totally uh, hierarchical network of relation going through persons and gods in this dense and complex system of relation. And this uh, hierarchy is incredibly important. I've seen situations uh, where performance of hierarchy alone sparks uh, possession or trance. And possession or trance is really important aspect of how, how you build gods in, in, in Canonbly. Uh, trance uh, rests on objectifying, you remove subjectivity, and then that makes space for another subject to, uh, to manifest, the possessing deity. The um, American phenomenologist uh, Thomas Saunders actually sees objectifying as the very object of religion, which is, I think is a quite awesome um, observation. Uh, but, but this hierarchy, it creates the preconditions for this objectification. If you're low in the uh, hierarchy, then you're very objectifiable. And this also means that the, the people who are low in the cannibal hierarchy, they experience much more trance and more powerful trance than the people higher in the cannibal hierarchy. So objectifying is effectuated in a number of different ways. 
There is like sexual objectification, there's racial objectification using colonial motives, there's symbolic, symbolic violence, there's aspects of more like literal violence, and there's all kinds of motives that rests on power relation. Uh, there is like a language and behavior that creates hierarchy and, and uh, fosters humility in specific ways. Um, one example of how power serves to objectify is, is sexual. Um, during trance, you receive the guard sexually, like a, a female sexual recipient receiving the penetrating masculine deity. Also, if it's a feminine deity penetrating a masculine human, right? Uh, and this is very uh, comparable to uh, what uh, Judith Butler sees as a uh, phallocentric signifying transfer of meaning that ecl eclipses the feminine subject. And cannibally, the subject about to be eclipsed is feminine or feminized. And uh, so there's a sexual power relation that objectifies in order to construct the god. Um, another example is trans as punishment. Transgressions tend to spark possession as a punishment. I remember uh, seeing a person overstep the borders of a person who was higher in the hierarchy, for instance. And um, she was quite rough, in, in quite rough in a sort of way of flirting with this uh, man who was quite a bit smaller than her, and both uh, homosexual persons, by the way. And he really felt that she was overstepping. So he whispered something in her ear and bam, she fell into trance immediately. Um, I've seen a um, person being interrupted mid-sentence, mid quite literally, by his, his guard, his Orisha coming to possess him because he said something that was transgressive, a little bit like, Ah, I can't be bothered with that stuff about ritual seclusion. <laughs> and got possessed like that. Um, so hierarchy um, creates relation by creating the preconditions for an objectifying relation. People very much uh, relate to their deities through other people, by the way. And, and, um, and, uh, and there's a, another hierarchical element is infantilizing, which serves a lot of different specific purposes. Parent-child relations are strongly relational, but they're also hierarchical. And these, these kind of metaphors, they create the networks of relating that realize the, the deities. So when a deity possesses a medium, then the deity is transformed through this relation. Uh, it now becomes a child of a leading priest, like the medium is a child of a leading priest. So the hierarchy facilitates a performance of the deity that makes it po possible to build its subject. The god is now being doctrinated, evolved, which is uh, that human is teaching the god how to become uh, a culturally appropriate itself. Um, so uh, hierarchy creates these preconditions to be able to construct the deities through different kinds of ritual and, and performance. Uh, one priestess explained to me how the god would be her mother uh, when it was not manifest, but she would be the mother of the gods when it was manifest in possession. So she was able to even update a deity for it to be cult uh, remain culturally functional and appropriate. She told me that uh, the goddess Bombashira used to smoke a cigar, but we don't see that as feminine anymore. So we teach her, we say to her, you know what, you can't go around there smoking a big cigar like Fidel Castro. It's not particularly ladylike. You know, you have to smoke uh, cigarettes. That works for a feminine woman. So smoking cigar may have been coded as, uh, as femininity a generation ago in Bahia or something like that, but it isn't anymore. So humans doctrinate the god to represent what it's supposed to represent with contextually uh, appropriate uh, means and uh, motifs. So uh, and explanations uh, like this uh, always rest on hierarchy. This priestess consistently emphasized her position in the hierarchy as ritually function functional. So uh, cultural, uh, cultural change, cult or culture changes, and then we build the God in ways that correspond with our, with our age. Uh, note how close my new animist understanding of what goes on is to her understanding, uh, her own understanding. I actually feel that I can stand in my knowledge paradigm and like authentically learn from her how stuff actually works. Uh, and I feel this has worked out for me analytically. Uh, I don't think I have ended up with pseudoscience or anything like that. Um, in fact, I, I've received very positive feedback on my, my thesis, partly to my own surprise. I've, I've felt quite isolated, actually, with these perspectives. Um, 
for instance, when I delivered this paper in, uh, in Oslo, I got very spirited reactions from my, my colleagues, uh, part of them accusing me of discarding science uh, with these uh, interesting metaphors, throwing science out the window or pulling the rock away from under science and so on. Um, a very clear affirmation, by the way, of my beginning uh, proposition that there is far too normative a construction of religion as a defining other to scholarship. So if there's a if there's a mix between these two knowledge paradigms, then a very strong transgression is is perceived, um, which of course uh, spurs these almost a little bit apocalyptic language in in the reactions. Um, these reactions, by the way, were mostly targeted at my last little story here, which is actually just an anecdote about the wider scientific applicability of this very emic, you might call it, brand of uh, research. Uh, and I think this uh, story provoked the reactions because it it's, uh, very strongly iconizes the transgression between science and its uh, defining other. So when I tell it now, then just try to not forget what came, became before. For instance, my rendering of how relational anthropology can be used to understand hierarchy. I mean, that's actually my, my work. <laughs> um, but anyway, my work has, has found a perhaps somewhat surprising application, uh, which uh, really accentuates this contact between scientific and religious knowledge. Um, on a North European university hospital, there's a psychologist that I know who is working on a methodology which is partly inspired by uh, my work and by conversations with me. Um, and uh, he's applying new animist uh, individuation theory on voice hearing. Uh, and we've had contact on, over the internet and I've told him about how subjectivity is managed in, in, in Canoblé. Um, and he's applying part of this in his uh, therapeutic work. And uh, until now, there's been a remarkable uh, uh, effect of this uh, kind of theory, considerable effect. Um, several of the people he has worked with has have shown marked improvement. Uh, my friend is, is being headhunted because this theory, uh, this um, uh, therapy is so incredibly effective. Uh, and there are examples of people uh, being brought from a situation of repeated, uh, being repeatedly being committed to psychiatry and several suicide attempts and into a considerably improved uh, life. And this isn't really all that weird. If you go into the world and you study how subjectivity works, then this knowledge is useful, you know, to understand and handle when people have tr trouble with their subjectivity. It's not, you know, it's not all that weird, really. Um, but but it's an example of how you can get a high scientific impact and, and results from a synergetic, or syne synergetic, synergetic, uh, symmetrical attitude towards religious knowledge. And when you go out and learn from other contexts like this, then you can really improve your capacity and technology, also in your own knowledge paradigm. Now, I basically went to my Brazil with my, you know, going native hippie anthropology and asked, asked to learn about how cannibal devotees uh, handle subjectivity. Then I learned from it, bring it back, and in, in exactly the uh, synergy or knowledge exchange facilitated by the permissive epistemology that I'm working from uh, and uh, the new animist theory means that the, the, these data can be operationalized rather directly in produ providing very functional and efficient results, psychiatric help to people with very serious problems. Now the per patients thanking me personally for having gotten a life without knowing who I am because the uh, psychologist told them that he, his work wa uh, was inspired by contact with a guy. <laughs> um, now, and if you look at this from the perspective of theory of science, like think, thinking with empirical evidence and so on, then the result is that moving all the way like deep into a religious mindset with these kind of positions can produce data and insights with such an explanatory power. And I'm almost, almost tempted to say descriptive precision that you can apparently use it in a psychiatric health work to an astonishingly positive effect like radically improving the life of people with serious problems. And uh, time has yet to show the potential in this kind of uh, therapy, but there's a lot to suggest that it's a very concrete contribution to our capacity to handle uh, um, uh, problems uh, where other kinds of treatment hasn't helped at all. Um, it should also be mentioned that this kind of collaboration is actually not unique. You find it in both uh, Brazil and Cuba. Uh, in, in Cuba, by the way, there's also a a bit of an aggressive secularism, so uh, people need to work under the radar with stuff like that. 
So summing up, you could say that potentially we have moved quite a far stretch from the old colonial Im imagery of religion as a kind of craziness or mental disorder or criminal insanity. If scholarship is practiced today with a sympathetic contemporary attitude, then a collaboration with religious knowledge can actually contribute quite substantially, not only to our general research in history of religions, but also to very concrete, uh, measurable health issues, like uh, helping people with very, very serious uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, this kind of collaboration is, of course, complicated by these old uh, modernist uh, idiosyncrasies that are still somehow tagging along uh, and creating uh, somehow strong uh, reactions. But the bottom line is that today it is fully possible to bypass whatever colonial hierarchies that might still be somehow defining our research and enter into synergy with uh, produced knowledge, um, which I believe can be characterized as basic research, as certainly opening new uh, areas for how to produce knowledge and technology that can be useful for human life. Um, yes, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And um, just a little note, which is that uh, if you happen to be some sort of research funding connection and you are interested in the incredibly groundbreaking work of my psychologist friends, then be advised that he is actually struggling and uh, just contact me and I'll put you in contact with him. Um, so uh, yeah, to make research happen is part of his job and he actually needs research to really make the whole thing work. So uh, that's just a little, a little recommendation. He's uh, sitting in a, in a marginal corner of Northern Europe and working on, I think, some of the most uh, uh, brilliant uh, research that I, I know being happening right now. Cool, thank you very much. See you around.